Cute kitty. Can everyone hear and see me? Yes or no? Yep, I can hear you. Okay. Yep, I can hear and see you. Okay. Somebody has a cute cat. Haley, you have a cute cat. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Let's see here. So you will realize I put up the PowerPoint for chapter two, but I don't have a review worksheet up there yet. Give me until tomorrow to get it up on there. Um, today, just, tr I will try to help you, I'll, I'll try to take, make note of what things that you need to be able to remember, but I will get a worksheet up there between now and tomorrow afternoon. Let's see here. Somebody just texted me saying they can't hear or s hear anything, so let's see what happens. to show you something and I think I'm going to come into how this is viewed as a student. Gotten some emails about due dates and you guys, when you look at your screen, when you look at your D2L screen, do you see this on the side that I'm scrolling at right now where my mouse is? Do you see that? So it, it tells you when your due dates are. For each, I, I'm guessing this is the way it is for each of your classes. Do you, when you go into your D2L screen, do you see that information on there? Okay. I think that might help with getting, making sure that you know when your due dates are. 
I am going, the only one that is not set up to close at about one in the morning is, is this one right here, the chapter one quiz. I know some people have already taken it. So it's open to you. And remember, it's got 15 questions. It's true or false, multiple choice. And you have two minutes per question, and you have two attempts to take the quiz. Um, let's see here. One thing that I, will, I, I was looking at, oh, with regards to lab, did you guys, did anybody try to watch those videos on their own over the weekend? Were you able to do it? Yeah. Okay. When, no, it didn't work for me. Courtney, when, when did you try to get on there and, and participate in that? Uh, that was yesterday around like 1, 2 o'clock-ish. Emily, when, that. when did you try to do it? I tried all weekend, and it kept saying page not found. Okay. Try so I just Googled, like, I just put the link into YouTube and did it that way. Well, try to do it now, because I, um, Courtney, she did it yesterday, and the reason it worked for her, and it probably didn't work for you, is they weren't put in right. <laughs> I didn't get them put in there right, and I didn't, I, I got some response is saying that they, they weren't working and I spent my um, probably two hours with the um, with the D2L specialist for hack and okay. they should all be in there right and they should all be in there for all of the labs we have this semester. Okay, let me see if they work. Yeah, for some reason they still don't play, email me and let me know. But they should play at this point and they, they, you should not have a problem getting them to play. One thing that I know is a problem is if, um, if your computer has a pop-up blocker, they will not play. Um, let's see here. One other thing. With regards to the labs, there were a lot of terminology, there's a lot of terminology. The more of that terminology that you can learn right now, the better off you will be. I, I know there's a lot of it. I know it's a little overwhelming and I will just tell you, it's going to get, there's going to be even more of it. The best way that I know to learn some of that terminology is possibly flashcards. Another way to learn that terminology is to print out a sheet. Like, for example, actually, I'm going to go into the lab really quickly here. Waiting for you to let me in. Why is it? There she is. Okay. If we come into the lab. Yeah, the videos are working now. Good. Good. Because, yes, I, I just, I, I had them in, like a prior professor had had them in this summer. And they may have worked for her this summer but they weren't working for me. And so she, they were working on my computer, but they weren't working when I tried to switch it over to, a stu to what you would see. So they should work at this point. Um, let's see, I'm gonna come in, play into one of the labs. Now, the first lab, and I'm going to come down, and I'm actually going to look at or uh, might be this one. Uh, 
I'm going to look down here. The best way to learn this terminology, so, such as superior, inferior, anterior, posterior, medial, lateral, and so forth, is to use it in context. You use take these do these activities activity three where you know what is this relative to your scalp what is where is this relative to your nose use it in context and I honestly believe that if you start using those terms by the end of this semester, those terms will be second, it'll be, um, what's the word for it? It will be um, a knowledge that you don't even have to think about when you use it. For example, you won't, you won't even have to think about whether or not something is superior or inferior, you'll just know. Major body regions, Let's see here. I want to scroll down. Look, look at these. We talked, there was that um, in your book in Atlas A and um, in the videos, they talk about these regions. Quiz yourself on them. What, what's this region? What's this region? What's this region right here? Quiz yourself on this. If you start learning it now, when we start getting into the very intense anatomy, which is going to start pretty quickly here, and it's mainly lab where we will focus on anatomy. If you start learning those terms now, Learning the anatomy will be a lot easier for you. Because if you remember, I, I think I said it last week, this is a word puzzle. Anatomy is a word puzzle. If you can know the name of something in that region, you can guess what the names of other things are in that region and be right. Trying to find what I'm looking for here. I may let me look in the other PowerPoint. Because I want I want to specifically look at one thing. This is what I want. This was what I was looking for. So in a couple weeks, we're gonna be we're gonna be looking at the anatomy of bones. We're gonna be and in a couple weeks after that, we're gonna be looking at the naming muscles. A lot of our bones and our muscles are named after the regions where they're located using this terminology. For example, the, pop, the popliteus here is the knee. The, the ligament that actually holds your kneecap on, and holds it down on your knee is called the popliteal ligament. So if you can learn this word, you can learn that, knowing what that ligament is, is going to be a lot easier for you. And remembering what that ligament is, is going to be a lot easier for you. 
I talked about this area the other day, the cal calcaneus. Guess what your ankle bone is called? It's called the calcaneus. It's the strongest bone in your body because it's the bone that you put the most weight on all the time. Um, gluteus here. We have a gluteus maximus muscle. We have a gluteus minimus muscle. Maximus meaning there's a big, big gluteus muscle. Minimus meaning there's a little gluteus muscle. If you can learn what this term is right here, when, you, when I ask on a lab quest what a specific muscle is in this region, if you just put down gluteus, you have partial credit on it. Um, what's another one? This area right here, your femur. Well, guess, guess what the bone is called there, your femur. If you can learn these terms, it's going to make your life a lot easier. If flashcards do not work for you, because sometimes that's difficult when it comes to anatomy, the other thing that I know I've used in the past to help me learn anatomy is to print this sheet out and look at it three times before you go to bed. And I would even, I would even, as you're go, as you're getting ready for bed, read them out loud to yourself. Because if you read them and you, at the same time that you're reading them out loud, you're saying them and you're also hearing them, read it out three times to yourself. The next morning, look at it one time and do the same thing. Then when you go to bed that night, do it again. Read it out loud to yourself three times. Start at the very top, look at it, and read it out. For you. Read it out to yourself. And I can guarantee that within a week you will know all these terms, and possibly within a day or two, you will know all these terms. Because when I say do it right before you go to bed, it's because you will think about it all, all, all night long. In your subconscious mind, you will think about it all night long. You will, you will learn these terms. So it looks kind of daunting right now. But if you work on it on a regular daily basis, and I wouldn't say put a lot of time into it because I'm saying read it three times before you go to bed, read it one time before you, after you wake up. By the end of the semester, you will, and within a matter of a week, you will know these terms. When we start talking about bones here in a couple of weeks, don't, that will be a lot easier for you because you know these. When we start talking about muscles, it will be a lot easier for you because you know these. Any questions about that? So you guys, I do need to let you know, and and I will I'll try to let you know every time that we we're we're together like this on Zoom. This is being recorded. In one of my classes here at Hack, I have a student that's been called for called to for the National Guard, and so the main way that she's going to learn these classes is to watch the videos. And so we're going to be recording them every time. And I will try, and so if you don't want to be recorded, the one way that you can avoid being recorded is to mute yourself and lock your video.
trying to remember where we left off. I think we talked about this. I think we are right here. Does that look about right from a week ago? Are we, we actually, we weren't able to be very much involved with this because we didn't get a chance to be involved in Zoom. Um, Look over, look over this PowerPoint, work on those worksheets. Are there any questions about this material? Were you, did you get a chance to look at it before today? Yeah, I spent most of yesterday, just, I took a whole bunch of notes, um, went through the connect activity for this, um, and like got actually onto the book, the ebook, and wrote everything down and did all the questions. Um, I wanted to know, are those worksheets going to be graded? No, no. But if you, if you, it's essentially, it's a review sheet for you. If you know what's on there, you will, you are most likely, you have a 99% chance of getting the answers right on the exam. It's more like a study sheet net for exactly. us. For the exactly. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Um, let me start. I'll, I'll come up here. So I'm going to go through this fairly quickly, but if you have questions, let me know. Look at this also on your own time. Anatomy is the study of structures and the relationships among the structures. The first studies were done with dissection. Most recently, we use a lot of imaging techniques. Physiology is the study of how those structures function. One word that we're going to hear a lot of this semester is complementarity. This is how, how I, the ob, function of an object relies on its structure. If the structure gets altered, the function will get altered. For example, I have this picture. This is the heart here. And the, the way this is depicted in this picture is there is a muscle that starts about right here. It wraps around, it comes back to the back, wraps around here, comes down here, comes down here, and comes back up here. So it's it's like a circle that's wrapped around this organ. It's like a, it's like a rubber band that's wrapped around this organ. Now, if you consider that's like a hair tie that's been wrapped around very distinctly or, or an elastic that's been wrapped around there very, very intricately, but then we constrict that elastic or that elastic tightens up. What is going to happen to the volume within the heart? It'll shrink. It's going to shrink. What's going to happen to anything that's in that? volume. It'll get stuck or it will get really thick. Yeah, or it'll it'll compress. It'll compress them, but but there's all these areas where that the stuff that gets compressed in there can move out. So what will happen to that stuff? It doesn't it'll get stuck. Go ahead, Courtney. I was just going to say it either gets expelled from inside the heart or nothing can get in or can get out. So then the heart would stop because there's no blood flow. It's, well, it's going gonna, it's gonna to relax again, but it's going to constrict and then it's going to relax. It's going to constrict and then it's going to relax. So it's going to get all pushed out. So the way that the heart muscle is set up around the heart allows for the heart to become a very effective pump. And it's, in it's intentionally set up that way.
So a lot of heart, a lot of anatomical structures, their function can be um, can be guessed at or be estimated. You can estimate what their function is frequently based on characteristics of their structure, based on structural characteristics. Some techniques that have been developed for looking into the body without having to perform dissections. One of the first ones were x-rays. X-rays are low level, low and let's see, wavelengths of light that pass through the soft tissues of the body. And when they pass through, some of them get diffracted. If you think about the diffraction of light, some of them get diffracted. And when they get diffracted, they, they radiate onto a photographic film that produces dark images. This accounts for about 50% of all medical imaging. For hollow organs and vessels, if you're familiar, if, um, let's see how, what's done here is you, an ink or a dye or some form of medium is injected into either your subclavian artery or your femoral artery. And if you if you remember what I said a minute ago, where's your where's your femur? In your thigh. It's in your thigh. So your femur so your femoral artery is down there where runs a lot in alignment with your thigh. So your femur and your femoral artery run in alignment with one another. So mm -hmm. They can inject medium e either into your femoral artery or your subclavian artery. I have a question for you. What is this bone right here? What's this bone right here? The clavicle. What's the clavicle? Yeah. What does sub, sub mean? S-U-B. Under. Under. So your subclavian artery runs underneath your clavicle. So I'm, I'm, I hope by the end of the semester, you, when we're, when we're talking about anatomy and how it relates to physiology, I hope that you learn that a lot of anatomy is a word puzzle. If you can learn certain terms, you can learn other terms. So your femoral artery runs along with your femur. Your subclavian artery runs underneath your clavicle. So in this technique of digital subtraction angiography, angio means blood vessel, gravi, gravi, excuse me, angiography, angiography. Ography means um, to take a picture of something. So angio mean, means blood vessel, ography means taking a picture. So this is taking a picture of a vessel. So an contrasting medium, an ink or um, a radioactive substance is injected into the vessels. It can either be blood vessels or it can also be the intestinal tract. And then a picture is taken where the background is minimized and only the ink is viewed. So you subtract out the background and you get a picture of what that vessel looks like. For example, this is actually your aortic arch. If you see right here, if you remember from up here, here's the heart, here's the aortic arch. 
Here's the heart right here. Here's the aortic arch. So my guess is for this one, the ink was injected into the subclavian artery. And then they take, then they eliminate the background and what you get is a very good picture of the aortic arch. Here we're looking at, I want to say, the carotid artery. Sonography is the second oldest and most widely used image of, method of imaging. It's, sonography is looking at sound waves. So an ultrasound is a, is, a sonography is also what we refer to as an ultrasound. Mechanics involved is that a handheld device is pressed against the skin that produces a high frequency sound. And sonograms are made where the sound waves echo back from internal organs. So the high frequency sound echo bounces off internal organs and the bouncing off of those wavelengths allows for a, a, a photo to be made of what that the internal organs look like. This, this avoids harm, the, the benefits of this is that it avoids harmful x-rays frequently used in, obstet in obstetrics, also used in measuring fetal movement, looking at the heart wall, looking at the blood flow. Um, I know it was recently used to look at one of my cats where they actually used it to look at his intestinal tract and look at the, let's see here, how do you put this? In looking at the, um, looking at the tissue of his intestinal tract. CT scanning. Computed tomography scan, formerly called a CAT scan, uses low intensity x-rays and computer analysis. Can be used to detect things such as tumors, aneurysms, cerebral hemorrhages, or cerebral hemorrhage means to a breaking of the blood vessels within the brain, uh, and kidney stones. If you look at this top one, this is a transverse section. If you remember transverse from the other day, cutting through the trunk, cutting horizontally through the trunk. If you look right here, this is the back of the person. This is the front. What is that probably right there? A pituitary gland? I'm close. So what, what, if you're going through the trunk, so you're looking almost through oh, the, the spinal cord. It's the spinal cord, you're right. Um, right here is, and I want to say we are looking up here. So we're looking at a section that goes right through here. And then we're looking up at it. So a section right here, and then you flip it up and you're looking at it this way. Because I'm looking at this, and this is the liver right here. This is the liver. If this is a liver, do you remember what these two structures were that tend to be behind the peritoneal cavity or are behind the peritoneal cavity? And that we have two of them normally. 
Is it the kidneys? It's the kidneys, you're right. So this right here, this little white dot, is a kidney stone. Hi, Doctor. Say it again. Hello? Hi, Esther. No, I'm not seeing your screen. I'm sending a message, but I'm not seeing your screen at all. You're not seeing the screen at all? Yes, I sent for you private, but no answer. I did you email me or did you text? Yeah, I'm hearing. I'm hearing. You know, I text in the chat actually. I is your number is it seven one seven two three nine? Yes. Okay, I'm sorry. See, I don't have a name associated with it. I just, uh, just okay. your number. That's my number. <laughs> the two you know Esther while you're on your phone can you call the tech line and see if you can if they can help you figure out how to get in and be able to see the, my screen uh, you are joined but I'm not seeing your screen I'm here in the meeting I I'm not seeing your screen try rejoining it shall I leave and join again Yes. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Thank you. So with with CT scans, you're looking at in you're looking at sections throughout and they can be sagittal sections, they can be frontal sections, they can be transverse sections. Both of these are transverse sections. This one right here is within the within the brain. This the front of the brain, the back of the brain. This is a hemorrhage, where we're looking at out, where a bleeding, uh, the pattern of bleeding within the brain. Bear with me just for a second here. I just want to make sure that I'm. Getting everybody here. Okay. MRI scans are better than CT scans for visualizing soft tissue. The brain and so you, we like to use x-rays and CT scans for, for viewing harder tissues. However, for, for looking at softer tissues, we like to use MRIs or magnetic resonance imaging. With the term magnetic, what it, it infers or lets you know that we're gonna use a magnetic field here. We're going to, a magnetic field is developed across the area to allow for the alignment of hydrogen atoms within those tissues. And the very levels of energy that are given off by the, that alignment and realignment of the hydrogen atoms allows for the computer to produce an image. This is actually looking at a meniscus of the knee and looking at a, a protrusion of the meniscus. So in between the feet, head of the femur here, the, the head of the tibia here, and here's the fibula right here, right here, there is a mass of cartilage. So magnetic resonance imaging is used best for, member, for visualizing softer tissues. PET scans are used to assess the metabolic activity within a tissue. Metabolic meaning the chemical reactions that are how, how active 
chemically is that tissue? How physiologically active is that tissue? PET stands for positron emission tomography. It allows you to determine which tissues are most active at that given moment. So which tissues are most physiologically active at that moment. What is usually done here is a radioactively labeled glucose tracer. And why, why do you think they would use glucose? Guys, why do you think they would use glucose? It's the easiest uh, like chemical thing to break down. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a universal, it's, it is, the universal sugar source that is broken down in all tissues, readily taken up, readily broken down. So a radioactive labeled glucose tracer is injected into the body and it put, releases radioactive protons, which are called positrons, that collide with electrons. And when those radioactive protons collide with the electrons, they give off gamma rays. The emission of those gamma rays can be measured by a sensor that then is analyzed by a computer and an image shows which tissues are using the most glucose at that moment. This picture right here shows a normal brain with, and the basal ganglia within the, within the brain. And the basal ganglia are very active and for your for your um, it's a word for it, your um, balance and so forth. In Parkinson's disease, your basal ganglia are the most likely, one of the most likely affected organs. So in a brain with Parkinson's disease, you see that the, the metabolic activity of the basal ganglia goes down significantly. So the images that, so the organs that are most lit up are the ones that are most metabolically active at that moment. So what structures are better seen by an MRI than an X-ray? Soft tissues. Soft tissues. What structures are best seen by an X-ray than a PET scan? Harder structures. Harder structures. A PET scan is, is looking at metabolic activities. So more, more assessing the physiological activity. X-rays are more for, look, for observing the yeah. characteristics of a structure. Ellen is pregnant and she tells Janet, one of her coworkers, that she is scheduled to get a fetal sonogram. Janet expresses alarm and warns Ellen about the danger of exposing an X ray, a fetus to X rays. Is Janet's concern warranted? No. Why? Because a sonogram is like an ultrasound and it has to deal with sounds, not X rays. Right. It's high frequency sound and not X-rays. You're not, you're not even using radiation. 
So do you guys remember that term from a couple minutes ago, complementarity? Yes. What does complementarity mean? The shape of the structure is important to its function. Correct. Correct. So the structure of a part of the body allows for the performance of certain functions. Right here, looking at the bones of the skull, or the cranium, or another word for this is the calvarium. Cranium meaning the bones that encompass the brain. So the bones of the skull provide protection for the brain. They're flat, flat bones that essentially cover it and protect it. Air sacs of the lungs permit the movement of gases like carbon dioxide and water. Would the eye also be a good example, like the shape of the eye and um, if you have astigmatism, that could be an example of it impacting the function? Uh-huh. If you, if you think about um, people who wear glasses, what what's occurred there, and you can see I wear glasses, what's happened there is the lens that can change shapes based on whether you're seeing close or you're seeing farther away becomes less flexible. When we talk about special senses in a couple months, we'll talk about how that works and why it works the way it works. Um, On the back of your eye, who who was it who actually asked about vision there? Uh, me, Michaela. Michaela, in a couple in a couple of weeks, I'm gonna ask I'm gonna ask you to explain to me how that structure works. Um, but yes, yeah, so the lens, it, it works like a magnifying glass and it can either, sh it can either thicken up or thin out depending on whether you're trying to see far away or closer up. So the structure of a body part allows for the performance of certain functions. Um, outside of vision, what are other examples of complementarity that you can think of? Would the thyroid be one? Why? Because the thyroid is in like every part of your body and if the thyroid is off, all your hormones will be off. Um, and depending if you're hypo or hyper can be make a huge difference. It can, it can make a, it's the thyroid hormone is everywhere and yet it can make a difference in whether or not you, the rest of your, act, your, the rest of your metabolic activities work very well. Um, trying to think what another good example is. Say it again. I, I'm not hearing you very well. Say it one more time. Would your lymph nodes be one? Your lymph nodes, why? Um, because that stops, um, <clears throat> that stops, uh, like infections and stuff like that, infectious. Um, material from getting inside the body. Mm -hmm. There is it, it. It doesn't work so well to stop infections from getting in. But one thing that it is is it is a specialized structure that has a lot of immune cells within it, and there is a lot of blood flow, or or not blood flow, but lymph, which is. Um, 
extra fluid from the blood that's getting returned to the heart that drains through the lymph nodes all the time. And any bacteria or any foreign substances that are within there are easily sensed by the immune system when they drain through those nodes. So yes, it, it's an area where there's a lot of immune cells within a very small space and there's a lot of fluid that flows through it. And anything that's foreign within that fluid is gonna be easily detected. Yes, yeah, so that is a good, yes, that's a good example. How does one assess certain aspects of body structure and function? First one is inspection, looking at a, at a body's appearance, a presence of a rash or, um, or a bruise or what else can you see with inspection? Um, a sty in the eye? What you are can the see a bunch of different like, dermatol like dermatological problems like um, eczema or acne. Acne. Chicken pox. Chicken pox, yes. Palpitation. Gently touching body surfaces with the hands, looking, looking at the pulse or the heart rate. Oh. Ask, auscultation? or auscultation, listening to body sounds to evaluate the functioning of certain organs, listening to the lungs or heart using a stethoscope. Percussion, tapping on the body surface with fingertips and listening for to the resulting echo. or even measuring how, um, how hard or soft a tissue is. An inflamed abdomen would probably feel, is going to feel a lot firmer than one that isn't inflamed. Another way to assess certain aspects of body structure and function is a dissection. Cutting and separating the body tissues to reveal relationships between the tissues. Comparative anatomy is looking at the same anatomy in another organism. So studying multiple species to learn about form, function, and evolution of certain body structures. I thought this one was interesting because if you, if you look at this, this is actually an earthworm here. And an earthworm's heart is five pieces. And it's five rings. And not being a really good comparative anatomist, I am looking at these rings, and they're and they're five rings, so they're they're five little elastic bands that constrict and relax. And when, and just like in our heart, when it constricts, it's going to push the blood out. When it relaxes, it's going to fill up. So we go from having uh, one organ here, one, one single very strong pump, and then we have an earthworm that has five separate contractile rings that pump the blood. So comparative anatomy, studying multiple species to learn about the form and function of different body structures within those organisms. Yeah. 
exploratory surgery, opening the body and taking a look to see, look inside and see what is wrong and what can be done about it. This is highly invasive normally. Um, it's a lot easier to, if, if, it can be avoided. It is a lot easier to use medical imaging rather than exploratory surgery. It's usually uh, one of the last, um, one of the, the last um, routes to be taken or one of the last options because it's, it can be highly invasive and the risk of infection, the healing time and, and so forth it's going to take a lot more time for you to heal up than to get an x-ray or an MRI and look at that tissue. So viewing the inside of the body without surgery. So either cutting into the body and looking to see what is wrong or using medical imaging to view the inside of the body without cutting into it. Histopathology, the microscopic examination of tissues or signs of disease. Right here, we're looking at a blood smear. And within a blood smear, we have a lot of red blood cells and then we have a handful of white blood cells. However, in the case of leukemia, all of a sudden the number of white blood cells goes up drastically and the number of red blood cells goes down drastically. So you're looking at the microscopic examination of tissues to look for signs of disease. Cytology, looking at the structure and function of cells. ultrastructure using an electron microscope to view the 3D structure of tissues. This would be similar to looking at a region here of about this underneath an electron microscope. If you look here, these little tiny, these discs, the same as these right here. Our red blood cells here, the 3D structure. Gross anatomy, using dissection and you can sometimes do a lot of surface anatomy to study structures that can be seen with the naked eye. Histology, microscopic anatomy, examination of tissues with the microscope. So name the method that would be used for each of the following, listening to a patient for a heart murmur. Escalation? Escalation. Auscultation, yes. Auscultation, I think it's auscultation. Um, but yes, call, uh, you guys, some, some of the terms, be able to worry more about being able to spell them than worrying about being able to pronounce them. Um, what about studying the microscopic structure of the liver? Cytology. Cytology. Um, that and what else? What other possibilities? What? Histology. For disease, histopathology. Histo histology, histopathology. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Microscopically, 
here's another more specific example, microscopically examining liver tissue for signs of hepatitis. Histopathology. Histopathology. Learning the vessels of, the, of a cadaver. Dissection. Okay, the dissection, gross anatomy. Performing a breast self-examination. Palpation. Palpation. Correct. So the body organization is a hierarchy of complexity with emergent properties. As different structures interact with other structures, new properties emerge. Organisms are composed of organ systems and organ systems are made up of organs. Multiple tissues come together to form an organ. Multiple cells come together to form a tissue. Multiple organelles or individual compartments within a cell come together in cells to form the function of a cell. Macromolecules such as DNA come together to allow the function of organelles like the nucleus. This is the mitochondria, of course, but the nucleus with DNA. And macromolecules are composed of at individual atoms. Organ systems come together to perform the functions necessary for life of an organism. So we have to be able to bring in nutrients. We also have to be able to get rid of waste. We have to be able to move fluids and body, um, body fluids throughout the body. So a circulatory system ha has to be able to move things to be able to transport nutrients and eliminate waste. We eliminate waste through the respiratory system and the urinary system. Bring in nutrients through the digestive system that transfers those nutrients into the cardiovascular system. So multiple organ systems come together to allow for the, the life of an organism. Which of these is a correct representation of the hierarchy of biological organization from the least to the most complex? I'm going to have you guys read the choices and you tell me which one. Start with organelle, the stem cell. Say it one more time. Organelle of a stem cell, the stem cell, the smallest one. Is it A, a B, or C? Mm -hmm. uh, C. How many of you guys think she's right? Yeah, it's, I'm pretty sure it should be C. I, I think she's right too. Atoms and molecules are what part? So it starts chemicals, cellular 
cellular level, tissue level, organ level. So atoms and molecules are of what part of the level of organization in the human body? I think I gave away the answer there, but what part? Cellular. No, nope. what's an atom? I was thinking chemical. Yeah, it's chemical. Mm -hmm. It's chemical. Because what, uh, what is an atom? A an atom is the simplest particle of a chemical element that, do that maintains the properties of that element. So it, it would be chemical. A structure made up of two or more types of tissues that performs a specific set of functions is at what level of organization? Organ? It's, an, it's the organ because multiple tissues come together to form an organ. Okay, this here is a hierarchy of complexity concepts map. These are really helpful in understanding physiology and learning physiology in that they allow you to, to conceptualize the interactions between multiple organ systems and multiple organs. For example, the urinary system includes the bladder. And what else might the urinary system include? Ureters. The ureters, yes. The urinary system filters what? Huh? It, fil oh, it filters the blood that comes from what? The kidneys. I would say blood vessels there. Digestive system breaks down what? Food, food. Food or nutrients that can be absorbed into small intestine. I would say into the blood here, or, oh, or no. filters blank from, I would, you know what, I think you're right, put in small intestines there. And you guys, if you look down here, and I, I didn't give you this before, here's a word bank you can use. So throughout this semester, concept maps can help you help you remember and understand the interaction between multiple organ systems and multiple organs within an organ system. Anatomical variation two. No two humans are exactly alike. An an excuse me, anatomy books show mo the most common organization of structures. However, some people lack certain muscles. Some people have an atypical number of vertebrae. Some people have an atypical number of organs. For example, some people only are born with one organ, one, excuse me, one kidney. Some people are born with what's called a horseshoe kidney, which we'll see on the next slide. That horseshoe kidney is a little weird looking. <laughs> it is a little weird looking. You're right. I agree with you. It looks like a horseshoe. Um, some people show citrus inversus, which is where Organs that are, and most people are on the left side are now on the right side.
So yes, that horseshoe kidney is a little strange looking, but it functions the same way. Some people have, and rather than having your two kidneys on exactly in the back part of your abdomen, you have one that, that's actually down in here in your pelvis. This is looking at the branches off the aorta. This is the normal. These are some of the variations. So basic life functions that can distinguish living from non-living organisms is an organization of the of the molecules or the macromolecules or the biomolecules within that organism. Cellular composition that all living things are made from cells. All cells perform metabolic activities. All living things are, are responsive to their environments and will can change to react to a, a stimulus. A lot of times reacting to a stimulus has to do with moving away from it or towards it. Homeostasis, maintaining a stable internal environment within a, within a limited range. For example, body temperature. So you don't need to meet all of these though to be considered considered living though, right? Because not all like, not all plants move. I know some of them move towards the sun, but... What, what plant do you know of that doesn't move? Like a cactus? You know what, they still move. They just don't they move. move as fast. Okay. Also like with reproduction, not all creatures are able to necessarily. Like what? They like do. if you're just born without eggs or you have like some kind of genetic problem where you can't reproduce? Well, that, that's a, that's a, that is a defect in the organism. Okay. But nor, with, normally it would be able to reproduce. Okay. Um, there can be defects. Not, not all illness is a, is a lack of homeostasis. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. All living organisms are able to evolve and, and adapt from generation to generation. So cells are able to transport nutrients from one region of the cell to another just as the body is able to transport substances to different locations or skeletal muscles working within your skeleton. Skeletal muscles can transport you from a sofa to the refrigerator. What basic life process is illustrated by this description? Would that be movement? Movement. Movement. Yes. So homeostasis is the ability to detect change activate mechanisms to oppose it, and thereby maintain a stable internal conditions. So at room temperature, the temperature in, in a room falls below 19 degrees Celsius or 67 degrees Fahrenheit. The thermostat is then activated to, to turn up the heat. There's a certain amount of heat put out, 
the temperature in the room rises and then the thermostat shuts down. So it shuts, it lowers the heat, the room cools down, and we're back to this temperature again where it drops again, it comes, the thermostat comes on, more heat is put out into the room, the temperature rises, it shuts down, and the process starts again. This feedback mechanism of the temperature dropping and some, some structure activating a release of heat is referred to as a feedback mechanism, where it alters the original changes that triggered them. This is a feedback loop. So you, you feedback, it, the heat comes on, Heat comes on, heat is put out, the temperature rises, the thermostat, the, the amount of heat being produced drops, the room cools down. Once it gets down too low, the thermostat comes on again. So this is a feedback loop to maintain a temperature within a, within a small range. So what is the definition of homeostasis? Is it the ability to maintain relatively stable external conditions, even though the inside world changes continuously? When B, when the output shuts off the original effect of the stimulus C, the response enhances the original stimulus so that the response is accelerated or D, the ability to maintain relatively stable internal conditions even though the outside world changes continuously. D. It would be D. It's D. Yeah. D? Yes. So there are some components to maintaining this feedback loop or this level of homeostasis. There's a stimulus that produces a change in a variable. The variable, for example, let's make it temperature. Okay, So the stimulus causes a drop in the temperature. Let's say it all of a sudden gets very cold in the room. That change is detected by a receptor. You have thermal receptors on your skin that specifically detect temperature. Those thermal receptors send an input to the control center, which in this case is the nervous system, and tell the nervous system that the temperature is dropped in the, in the, on the skin. The nervous system puts out a signal that allows for micro-contraction of muscles or body shivering, which is the effector here. And the response is that that micro contraction of the muscles generates heat and brings up the body temperature. So you have a variable that changes, a receptor that detects that change in the variable. The receptor sends a message to a control center, or, an int or this is also called an integration center, that, that sends a message to an effector to, that stimulates change to bring that variable back to where it should be, within the range it should be. Muscle contraction is one way to bring up temperature. Another way is, is vasoconstriction or vasodilation. Vasal meaning veins. So 
your average body temperature is about 37 to 37.5 degrees Celsius. If it drops below that, but these vessels will constrict to help maintain a body temperature and to keep blood from freezing out the, inter the internal organs, from keep internal organs from freezing. When the temperature is up again, the vessels will vasodilate to, reduce, to release heat and allow heat to leave the body. So vasoconstriction at the surface of the cells, of, excuse me, of the surface of the skin. Vasodilation to allow heat to be released through the skin. Helps you maintain your internal body temperature within a narrow range. Is that understood? Yeah. Another type of example of maintaining homeostasis is a change in blood pressure. Someone, a person rises from the bed. At that point, gravity is pulling on the, on the blood and the blood drains from the upper body, creating an homeostatic imbalance in the flow of blood throughout the upper body. So the blood is pooling in the lower parts of the body. Receptors, borrow receptors. Borrow meaning pressure. If you think about a barometer, you know, what's a barometer? Ever seen a barometer before? B is in Bravo, A is in Alpha, R is in Romeo, O is in Oscar. Meter, barometer. I looked it up. Um, it's for like forecasting the weather and determining altitude. Uh, how, so at, how does it do that? Uh, it measures atmospheric pressure. Yep. So like a barometer that measures atmospheric pressure, the barometer bar, soon bar, bar receptors in the in the aortic arch and in the right atrium measure the blood pressure. So they were so when they when they feel a drop in the blood pressure those receptors send a signal to the integrating center or the control center. This is integrating control center interchangeable here. So like up here, control center, integrating center. Send a signal is released which actually causes the vessels to constrict allowing for blood pressure to increase. And the blood pressure rises back to normal levels and homeostasis is restored. So blood pressure in the, in the upper body around the heart drops when you stand up. A signal is sent to the, your integrating center or your nervous system saying that the blood pressure has dropped. The nervous system puts out a signal to constrict the blood vessels, narrowing the volume, the, the total volume within the blood vessels, allowing for blood pressure to increase. And homeostasis is restored.
more than anything right here, I want you to understand just that the, there's a feedback loop. There's a change. There's a receptor that, that senses that change. That receptor sends a signal to an integrating or control center that sends a signal to an effector that works to, that makes a change to restore the variable to where it needs to be, the blood pressure in this case. So regulating systems that, so these are our two integral or control centers, the nervous system and the endocrine system. Nervous system sends out nerve impulses via action potentials that causes rapid changes. So sends out an electrical impulse via action potentials. Endocrine system secretes hormones from glands into the blood that then go out and bind to receptors on cells that causes a change within those cells. So this is an electrical nerve impulse that moves by a change in an action potential, causes rapid changes. Endocrine system secretes hormones from glands that enter the blood that then reach, that then interact with receptors on cells to change the metabolic activities within the cells. These systems can either act together or independently. Go ahead. Is there a question? I don't think so. Okay. So negative feedback loops, there's a change in the change in the variable that push it, the, that change causes it to move out of the normal range where it needs to be. That sensed by a receptor that sends a signal to a, a control center or an integrating center. And if the control center puts out a signal to the effector to bring that variable back to where within the range it needs to be. That's a negative feedback loop where it's bringing it back. It, it's pulling it back to where it needs to be. Pulling the chip, re, re, restoring the variable back to where it needs to be. Positive feedback loop, on the other hand, the receptor senses a change. The receptor sends a signal to a control center that sends out another change, pushing that variable more out of the range, more out of range than it was before. So where, where you're, instead of just trying to bring things back to the, the range that they, the normal, regular physiological range, you're pushing it more out of the normal than it was before. You're making it more abnormal, let's see, what's the word for it? You're making it more intense than it was before making it a bigger change than it was before. So it, this is what occurs in childbirth. So, self, so it's a self-amplifying cycle where a change results in a greater change in the same direction. So in the case of childbirth, the head of the fetus puts pressure on the cervix, the neck of the uterus. When that pressure is felt by receptors in the cervix, 
nerve impulses are sent to the brain, to the pituitary gland, which secretes oxytocin. Oxytocin stimulates contractions of the uterus, causing the, the head of the fetus to, to be pushed harder onto the cervix. So more pressure is put on the, on the receptors within the cervix, which then cycles again, and more, with that more pressure is felt, the nerve sends impulses to the pituitary gland, causing more oxytocin to be released, and the uterus, to, which results in the uterus contracting even harder. And this cycle continues until there's no more pressure felt in the cervix, which means that the baby's been come out. So my question for you here is what are the components of this feedback loop? We talked about what they are in a, in a negative feedback loop. What are they here? Positive. What, what, are the, what are the components of a positive feedback loop, at least in this case? You, and remember, um, in the case of, of a feedback loop, we have a stimulus. We have a receptor. We have an integrating or control center. We have an effector. And then we have that, that change that's felt. What is it in this case? A receptors in the surface sending to, to the gland. So yep, there, that, the receptor, there's, there's pressure, there's receptors on the surface of the surface. surface. Yeah. Sending to pituitary gland. Brain. What's the pituitary gland in the in the case of the components of the feedback loop? A receptor. Or is it the pituitary gland? What's the integrating center? Let me let me put ask this differently. In the case of a positive feedback loop of childbirth, what is the stimulus? The baby's head against the cervix. Yeah. The baby's head against the cervix. Yes. What is the um, the receptor? The receptors inside of the cervix that detect the pressure. Yep. What is the integrating center or the control center? The pituitary the gland. The pituitary gland. What is the um what is the what is the action of the effector? Releasing oxytocin. The oxytocin, correct. And what is the what is the next result? What 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 is the result of the oxytocin? Increased contraction. Yeah, increased contraction of the uterus, which causes more pressure to be put in this on the the surface of the cervix by the baby's head.
So it's a self-amplifying cycle where where the the change that spent that was initiated is now amplified. Here's another example of another positive feedback loop. You get a break or a tear in a blood vessel wall. Platelets that are in the bloodstream regularly start to adhere to the, the break in the blood vessel wall. They release chemicals that attract even more platelets to that area. The platelets then, as more as the first platelets come, they, they stick to that wall and they release chemicals that then attract more platelets to come. And as the more and more platelets are attracted to that area, a platelet plug is formed. And the cycle continues until the there is no more blood being released from that tear. So rather than a than a, a pressure change here, it's the the release of fluid out of that vessel. When when there's no longer a signal that there's a torn vessel, the platelets will stop being activated. But until the tear is is the tearing is gone, the platelets are going to keep accumulating in this area and they're going to keep releasing chemicals until the tear is, is clogged or plugged up. Or is this even when like you cut your hand or something like that? Does that, yes. do the platelets do that too? Yes. Okay. Yes. Any, any time. So cutting your hand, you, if, um, cutting your hand, even your most basic cuts are going to cut a lot of blood vessels and therefore blood starts flowing from those vessels which activates the platelets that are flowing by, flowing by in that vessel. Um, I don't think we talk about blood vessels in this ch in this semester. However, when you um, next semester, when you learn about blood vessels, if um, you every every um, structure of your body has hundreds of blood vessels. So even a basic tear in my pinky here is going to break s several or 20 to 30 to 40 to 50 blood vessels. In the, in the, um, in the circulatory system, you have arteries, you have arterioles, and you have you have capillaries. Capillaries, if you could dissect away from the body everything except the capillaries, which they have done. I, I, I don't know if I told you guys if, we, if it was you that I spoke to about the body world exhibit. They have done this where they went through and they, and they essentially did a digital subtraction and geography looking at the capillaries of a cadaver. And then they subtracted, they, they took away all the tissue that was not blood vessels. And this form of the body 
the, the, the structure of the blood vessels and the, the, the form of the blood vessels takes on the exact same structure as the body. Bear with me, I'm going to show you something really, really quick here. Nice thing about being on Zoom. Larry. Geography. Hopefully, we'll, I'll be able to pull up a new image really quickly here. So I think it was Sabrina who was asking about the eye here and, and the vision and how it's related back to complementarity. Was that right, Sabrina? No, I think that was Michaela. Michaela, I'm sorry. Um, Mike, so here are all the capillaries and all the blood vessels in the internal part of the eye are the vitreous humor of the eye. Takes on the exact same spherical structure as the eyeball. That's pretty cool looking actually. It is, isn't it? It looks like those like electric balls you can tap. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's see. Gross. Gross. That does not interest me. <laughs> it's not gross. It's not gross. Um, let me see if I can find. I want to find something else. Oh, let's see. Capillaries and skin. One was really cool too. It was like green and blue, and you saw all the yellow veins going through. This one right here. Down a little more. A little more. He's down kind of far. Right there, next to the professor. Oh yeah. So all, all it takes on the exact same structure as the body itself, the the organ itself. That's so cool. Um, they talk about, and it, it's a, it's a part, when, when we talk about using, um, um, let's see here. We talk about using chemotherapy to st block tumor development. One thing that's out there that they, they frequently use is stop blood vessel development. Because if you can block blood vessel development to an area, you can block growth and metabolic activity of that area. So if you block the blood vessel development, you can stop the growth of a tumor. Because every tissue has to be within a few nanometers of a blood vessel or it will not survive. I guess it makes sense because it needs the blood flow. It needs the blood to survive. Right. It needs to be able to take in nutrients and get rid of waste every time. And my, my keyboard is acting really funky lately, so let me do one more. Oh, come on. Let's see here. I don't think I'm going to find the image I want. But yes, so when, when you, back to the original, as I get off on a tangent there, back to the original, when, when you cut your finger, you cut multiple vessels. You cut several, cut hundreds of vessels. So which of the following is an example of a negative feedback loop? During labor, uterine contractions stimulate the release of oxytocin, which strengthens the contractions of smooth muscle in the uterine wall. 
a decrease in blood pressure and heart function during the severe blood loss, formation of a claw or a scab after a person has received a cut to the arm, scratching at an itchy rash which makes the rash spread and itch even more. D. 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 I was going to say E, none of them. I don't think it's D because D, D, if you scratch it, it's an itchy rash and it only makes it itch more. That sounds that's pretty negative to me. Yeah, that's pretty self-amplifying. It just, you know, when it itches even more than it did before. Um, yeah. Decrease in blood pressure and heart function during. I would think so. I would think that's the answer too. Because you want, remember you want to maintain the blood pressure within a certain limit and when it drops, the blood pressure is also, oh, let, let me think here for a second here. Decrease in blood pressure. Because it's talking about severe blood loss, so if you're continually losing your blood, you're not going to be able to keep up the internal, you're not going to be able to get back to where you were before. Right. You guys, none of these examples, it's, it's, it's E. I think a few of you said E. It's E. If it said an increase in blood pressure, because then the vessels also constrict to help maintain flow. That's a negative feedback loop. If it was an increase. But B, it, B is positive. Yeah, uh, yeah, that would be a positive feedback. Yep. Um, if you've ever, if you've ever felt hurt when someone has gotten cut really badly, and you you measure their pulse at that moment. It's highly accelerated because they're even though they're losing blood, their so their blood pressure is going down in their vessels because they're losing volume. The heart is going to work harder to try to maintain the same amount of flow. So, if it was an increase in blood pressure, then that would be good, right? But decreases, they're dying. Right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Decreases that you're in real trouble and you've got to get a transfusion or someone's going to die. Mid we'll say with the negative, if, if you don't mind, um, the negative and the positive feedback, they're kind of opposite. So like I saw when, when you said scratching the itch, like that would sound positive to you because it's taking care of the itch. It's not because it's just sending more receptors to basically keep scratching. Right. So it's not exactly helping. It's it's weird. It's same thing with even like birth. Like it's a positive feedback to basically push the baby out, but it's not really a positive feedback for the woman because she's in a lot of pain. So when you have a negative feedback, it's basically trying to get you back into a normal like status. So yes. if that can maybe help, they're basically backwards. If, yes. if anybody are basically backwards you're right yes yes so one of them keeps pushing the change further one of them works to resist the change and bring it back yes exactly midway through a five mile workout a runner begins to sweat profusively the Sweat glands producing the sweat would be considered which part of the feedback loop? The receptor, the control center, or the effector? The effector. Why? Because it's responding to the increase in body temperature and it's um, making you sweat to cool you down. Right. Right. Exactly. Okay. Homeostasis is continuously being disrupted, disrupted by physical insults such as temperature, um, by a choking, changes in the internal environment. You get you get stressed. You get tired. 
Physi physiological stress, a mild to temporary disruption, balance can be quickly restored. An intense or prolonged disruption, poisoning or severe infections, Moderate imbalance is a disorder or an abnormality of structure and function. Disease specific for an illness with recon recognizable signs and symptoms. Local disease affects one part or limited region of the body. Systemic disease affects either the entire body or several parts. Guys, what's an example of a local disease? A local imbalance in homeostasis. Heart disease? I was gonna say the flu. <laughs> yeah. well, heart disease, I'm gonna say, and, and I, I actually looked this up because I wasn't sure what they were, what they were referring to here. Heart disease actually affects the whole body, if you okay. think about it because it's going to affect circulation throughout. What like about blindness, like ear infection? Say it again. I said ear infection. Ear infection, I think that can be considered a local disease depending on how long it goes on. When I looked it up, a local disease would be like um, a sprained ankle. A local disease would be like a broken finger. I, I think an ear infection, depending on how sick it makes you in the long run, a, a local disease can be, become systemic. Does that make sense? So if, if you have an ear infection that eventually causes you to run a temperature, that's systemic. A, a local disease, a break in a, a bone is a local disease unless that break becomes infected and then starts affecting other systems and other parts of the body. S um, symptoms are subjective changes such as a headache or nausea that, you, that can't be absorbed by somebody else. Signs are objective changes such as a fever or swelling in what, that can be absorbed or measured by a clinician or somebody else. A severe imbalance of homeostasis is death. That's what I'm saying. It's death. <laughs> is this a symptom or a sign? Fatigue. A sign? It's a sign because can someone Oh, yeah. Someone can't really measure. Well, it's more, it's a symptom because it's not something that someone else can measure. Can you measure someone else's fatigue or can, or is, the best they can do is tell you they're tired, right? What about a headache? Or joint pain? I feel like a headache is a symptom. Mm -hmm. Joint pain, if I if 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 you hurt your shoulder and you can't see any swelling around it, but someone says, Does this hurt? and they elevate your shoulder and you scream. It's usually a pretty good symptom. 
You may not see any swelling, but obviously they hurt that joint. Bro, a, a blood test that's positive usually involves antibodies, which which bind to something within the the bacteria. A blood test that's positive for Borrelia burgdorferi. You can with the, within that blood you can um, you can observe the coagulation of the antibodies with the bacteria. I can observe it. So I could take it if um, if I'm going to try to remember another name from this class. Let me think. If Michaela. If I took a blood sample from Michaela, she said she's been dealing with this infection. She doesn't know what, what's causing the infection. And, but she, you know, she feels kind of sick. She feels like she has a headache. She, she's just not feeling really well. And she's tired all the time. We, um, we take a blood sample and we test it with some antibodies, you introduce some antibodies for Borrelia, Burgdorferi, and it comes back. When I, when I bring the blood, when I mix up that blood sample, put it in a little tube, mix it up a little bit, and then I see coagulation, so I see, um, I see a little clumping, a clumping of the antibodies within the blood. It's a positive sign. It's a it's a good sign that what that she's got Borrelia in her blood. So that would be a sign, something I can measure. Bell's palsy, you can see that it's a paralysis of the the I want to say that's a trigeminal nerve or the facial nerve. It's a facial nerve. A tick bite. You pull out the tick. Obviously, you can see that the, the if you if you pull out the tick, yeah, obviously the tick bit bit made it. Someone got bitten by a tick. Bullseye rash is a sign of certain bites. or certain infections. Suri goes to her family doctor, tells her that she has a headache and she feels nauseated. The doctor checks Suri's temperature and finds that she has a fever. In the above situation, Suri's headache is a symptom of an illness, while the fever is a sign of an illness. Is this true or false? So a symptom is something that can only be felt by the patient, can only be observed by the patient that they, they sense within themselves. A sign is something that someone else can see. I would say true. It's true. Is there any way you'd be able to see pain if you like, can you like check nerves for reactivity? Is that like a thing that can be done? They can do that, but what they, what they normally look for is they, um, they still see if you sense it. Okay. For example, if you're looking to see if somebody, um, somebody's had a neck injury, you go and you touch their foot to see if they can still feel their foot. And they, they can tell you if they can feel it or not. Um, 
there are there are ways um one thing that they do with um talked about that digital subtraction and geography is they can look at the health of the blood vessels surrounding the nerves by using that digital subtraction and geography. You can look at the health of the blood vessels and if the blood vessels are healthy, the nerves are, are healthy. If the blood vessels have gone away, the nerve is probably is probably dying. Does that make sense? So that can be a sign that you can see to infer the health of the nerve. And then you can back that up with um, with looking at tests for peripheral neuropathy. Can you feel this? Does this cause pain? Does it not cause pain? Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. So a gradient is a difference in chemical concentration, charge, temperature, or pressure between two points. Matter and energy tend to flow down gradients. So a gradient is a difference of one area versus another area. Difference in concentration, difference in the, the amount of something in one area versus another area. Things tend to flow down. So they're going to flow from a high from a high area, area of a high to an area of a low, from high to low. Movement in the opposite direction is to go flow up the gradient. So moving down a gradient does not require any energy to put, be put into the system. To pull something up, to fight against gravity and pull something up, you have to put energy into it. Everything flows from high to a low, unless you put energy into it to push it the other way. When we talk about physiology, which we're, go we're going to keep coming back to gradients, because gradients are the, I would like to say gradients are the basis of physiology. Everything is going to move from a high to a low unless you have an opposing force of energy. Everything will move from high to a low. So chemicals flow from a high concentration to a low concentration. Charged particles will move from a high concentration of those particles to a lower concentration of those particles. Heat will flow from a, a, higher, con uh, a higher temperature to a lower temperature. You guys, let's take five minutes, move around for a second and come back. So about 10, 15, come back and we'll start chapter one. I'm sorry, chapter two. Are there any questions about this? Move around for a couple minutes. Get up and stretch. 
I'm going to get up and stretch. Come back in about five minutes and we'll start chapter two. I'm not muting my microscope, so if you want to say something to me, I am going to get up and move for a second. But if you want to ask me a question, something comes to you right now, just, just yell it at me and I'm not going very far away. Everything I have is yours. 
I had a quick question, Ms. Oh. Gessler. Um, there's something on Connect, it's called Prep and Anatomy. Oh. Um, there, there's something on, what, what, what is that? Like, because it, it asks a bunch of questions and it says you're not technically graded, but it's due, it said by September 8th. So I was just curious what that was. I, I'm not going to remember what your, give me one second, let me get my, that's fine. Yeah. Not M A E. with me. I'm, I don't know why it's not coming up, so give me one second here. No, that's fine. If you go back two spaces, it looks like it's at the bottom of the search recommendations, if you go back one. So like if you delete the D and the E. Oh, uh, maybe one more. I don't know, I saw it while you were typing. Right there at the bottom. It, this is what I had before, but it didn't bring up anything. Um, let me do something different here. Um, H E education dot com. I am that. Hopefully this is the right password. Yep. This one right here? Is that the right one? Or let's get rid of some of the stuff. Yeah, yeah, because it says prep anatomy and physiology. So I was just curious. I started to answer the questions that and go through it, but a lot of it we haven't even like touched on yet. So I was like, oh no, but it said it didn't really count towards a grade. You know what? Uh, it is one, I think I'm gonna I'm gonna do something else. Bear with me just for a second here. I think Um, it, you know what, complete it, it's worth 10 points. 
it is still it's 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 one of it's like um I kind of like that lab simulation yeah yeah okay uh, and it's like the the smart book learning assignments you just complete it and you get 10 points it's not it's not it it does go towards your grade but it's not going to give you like 9 out of 10 8 out of 10 it's going to give you 10 out of 10 by just doing it okay even if we do get some of them wrong that's not going to okay it's not a good right. effect exactly exactly so it, it's not you know it's not a matter of getting it right or wrong it's did you do it or did you not um, okay I have a question. What? about the um, lab simulations like where can I find those if you the, and also the readings like are the smart readings different from connect they are they're on that same site the chapter one reading my due date on it it says July 30th 2020 so I've completed it twice but it's not giving well, me any just you know what let me come in and look at it give me one moment here yeah, mine says July 27th, and it says... Oh, really? Me I thought I changed all those, but maybe I missed, maybe I missed it. Let me see here. Um, okay, that one is, that's not the right one. I thought I changed it. It's changed right there. Did, when, when did you check it last? Yesterday. Oh. And I'm this is chapter right one now. reading, not history. chapter one major themes of anatomy and physiology. It's the one that says chapter one reading. Yeah, but it's, it's the same. I think it's the same thing. In the grade book, it shows they're two different things. It does? All right. See, there's chapter one reading, and then there's chapter one major themes of anatomy and physiology. Oh, wow. All right. Let me, let me work on that one. Okay. So basically the lab simulations, the readings, and the connects can all be found under the same place? Yes. Okay. And there's just some stuff that's not up yet. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. So I should like the chapter two reading. Is that a thing? Or is that under the chemistry of life? It is. It's a smart work assignment. Okay. Yeah, I see that online. I will, you know what, I will look at these, the other things, I'll try to figure out what's going on there. Bear with me as I, I figure it out, okay? Oh, no, that's fine. Okay. Um, if you see, if you, if you, if you do a smart book assignment and for some reason it says that you didn't complete it, I think from what I understand, and, and SmartBook is, a, is an upgrade from the system that they used last semester, but it will show when you completed it, it will show on your side that you completed it. And if you go, if you complete it and it doesn't give you a grade for it, you go into your grades on D2L and, and it doesn't give you a grade for it, send me a picture of it either email it to me or text it to me send me a screenshot of your computer saying that you finished that completed that smart work assignment and i will update your grade i'll have to redo it because it only lets you recharge past the due date so you have to recomplete it it won't show you it won't show you that you completed it no, it just gives you the option to recharge it like you would after you completed something and it won't show you. It just says no credit awarded because technically we did it past due. But it, it does it, it, it. That, That's what it did for me too. <laughs> yeah, you only get one option to take a picture 
picture of it, and that's right after you complete it. If you exit out of that at all, which I did, because I wasn't sure what to do, then it won't show you it again. It doesn't. It doesn't show any record that you completed it. No, I can share my screen if you want me to. It just says um, attempts past due, no credit awarded, and then it says recharge. Yeah, that's what mine does too. Is this Sabrina talking to me, Courtney? I can see, but Sabrina. Is I mean, Michaela. mine says the same thing too, but. Um, I'm not explaining it to you, but mine is the same. You guys send me, send me an email. Send me that in an email. So showing me that it says attempts, what did you say it shows? Attempts do, attempts that you made an attempt and it's not giving you credit for it? Yeah, it says attempts past due, no credit awarded. Send me a screenshot of that. Yep, I'll do that really don't quick. don't redo it. If it's showing you that on your screen, send me a screenshot of that. Okay, and, but give yep. me I I'm being the beginning of the semester, and I I'm starting to teach at two more schools today. Um, I'm a little I have a lot on my plate lately, so it may take me a day or two to get that upgraded, but I will. If you if if you don't see it in like two or three days, feel free to harass harass me about it again and make sure that I get it up. Uh, uh, make sure I get it done. Okay. Aye aye. <laughs> All, right. All right. Let's get back into this. Let me see here. Enter. Yeah, don't redo it. If if you if it shows something like that, just send me a screenshot of that. Don't redo it. And if that happens again, if it happens with chapter two, let me know that too. And I obviously if it happens again with chapter two, it's a consistent problem that I need to fix. Everything else should be fine because the due dates are in the future. Like I did the prep anatomy and physiology and the major themes of anatomy and physiology and those worked fine and went right into the grade book just fine. So did the lab. Okay. I just sent you the screenshot of what mine looks like if you want to pull it up on your email and you can see for yourself. I, I believe you. I'll, I'll, one thing that I didn't say last week is I'm a fairly trusting person. If it if it happen if if I hear about multiple things happening to one person all at the same time, usually that's a sign that I'm probably not being someone's not being completely honest with me. But one time things like this, I believe you. Just send me send me a screenshot of it and I'll update it. Okay. So let's start chapter two here. And like I said, I will get a review worksheet out for you. Give me a day or two to get it done. And I will, I'll, I'll try to get it done tonight. So the chemistry of life, chapter two. One thing, and this isn't chapter two, this is still chapter one, but I want to, um, I want to revisit it really quickly. This is something from your early biology, biology courses, talked about the scientific method. Most of you are going into some healthcare field. Patients can come in with a problem. You're going to look at their signs and symptoms while well, you're going to look at their symptoms their signs, ask them about their symptoms, and try to develop a hypothesis or propose what could possibly be wrong. Then you're going to get some testable 
predictions, okay, if it's if this person has the flu, they they should have certain symptoms. They should have certain signs, right? If they only have some of those symptoms and signs, but they don't have others, then you probably need to revisit your hypothesis and look at something else. Um, an example of this, and I, I told you guys uh, earlier today that I um, that my I had my cat have a I have a cat right now who um he um and last May he started showing all the signs of being anorexic even though I was eating all the time and um he is. Normally, he, he's been about nine and a half to 11 pounds in weight. At the time that I finally, because I'm not always as observant as I should be, by the time I got him into the vet, he was at six and a half pounds. And the vet um, realized he was dehydrated, which is a, a sign, something he could see because his gums look really dry. His, his mouth gums look really dry. Um, and um, he could feel, based on the texture of his skin and pressure and, and doing um, palpitations, he could see that he was dehydrated overall. He could also see that he was very thin. His BMI's body mass index was very low. Um, so he generated some hypotheses. He um, told me it could be, you know, he could be having a thyroid issue, like someone said earlier about it, thyroid affecting a lot of organs based on what it puts out. Could be have a <clears throat> thyroid issue. He could, um, he could be having, um, issues with this intestinal tract because he obviously was not being, a, you know, eating all the time, but not being able, but not putting on weight and actually losing weight. Um, so that was another hypothesis. The first thing that he wanted to do was he, he took some blood from my cat and he sent it to a lab who came back and he got the results back and that's when we realized that he even though he was eating all the time he was breaking down his muscles because an enzyme that's called creatinine kinase was really high in his blood which shows that is is a creatinine kinase is a muscle breakdown enzyme so the reason my cat was losing all this weight was because he was breaking down his muscles. And, but when they looked at his thyroid hormones, looked at his thyroid levels the, and so forth, they were all normal. So obviously it wasn't the, the hypothesis of whether or not he had a thyroid problem was not supported. So he, he didn't have a thyroid problem. Um, Nevertheless, he was breaking down all his muscles. So why was he breaking down his muscles? Um, at that point, my vet sent, had me take my cat to the pet ER in Towson, Maryland. And they did an ultrasound on his stomach to look at his intestinal tissues. And what they found at that point was that along this tissue and if I if it was easy for me to go back to chapter one
Oh, that's not what I wanted. Well, let me just, let me not try to go back to chapter one. I'm going to come back up here. Um, the tissue between your intestinal tract and your blood vessels is really, really thin to allow for easy diffusion across from the intestinal tract into the blood. And when they did this ultrasound of my cat, they realized that he, um, that that tissue that should be very thin to allow for easy diffusion across the, from the, the intestinal tract into the blood had actually thickened up. So the tissue had become a lot thicker along the, the inside of his small intestinal tract. And what that meant was that the diffusion that, of the nutrients that should be going into his bloodstream was not being as effective as it should be. And so he was eating things, but he was just um, excreting it all out his waste because he wasn't absorbing anything. And so that was another, so that would be considered an observation. From that observation, two hypotheses were made. The first hypothesis was that he had um, inflammatory bowel disease, which is which causes a thickening of the intestinal the tissue along the intestinal tract. The other possibility was that he had. Um, uh, a cancer, a lymphomic cancer, because that would also cause a thickening, because it, it would, a cancer meaning a growth, so a growth of that tissue, which would cause thickening of that tissue. Um, what, the only way to diagnose whether or not it would be cancer or it would be just an inflammation of that the tract would be to do a biopsy. Well, I last over that taking having my, taking my vet cat into the vet, then taking him to the ER. Between those two appointments, it cost me almost two thousand dollars. And so I have decided at this point not to do the biopsy. And I decided that at the beginning of the summer not to do the biopsy, but try to treat it as I would um, inflammatory bowel disease and treat him just with putting him on a special food. And if it was inflammatory bowel disease, hopefully putting him on a special food that would be more easily digested and more easily transmitted from his intestinal tract into his bloodstream that would so solve the problem and allow my cat to start putting on weight again and start develop being a healthier cat. If it was cancer, that would work for a little while and then it would stop working because the tissue would still become too thick and he'd still not be able to diffuse the nutrients. Um, currently, that cat is now on a special diet uh, eat more easily diffusible food, more easily digestible food, and he's back to being 11 pounds. Um, so I would say at this point that my hypothesis of my cat having inflammatory bowel disease is being supported. If, um, if in a month or so, if my cat starts going downhill again and starts losing weight drastically, that would be a sign also that he's, it wasn't inflammatory bowel disease, but it was actually cancer. So when you get a patient in who, who's showing multiple signs and symptoms, you start thinking in your head, 
well, it could be this, it could be that, it might be this, it might be that. And then you start looking at, well, what other things, this is where um, a, de a deductive reasoning comes into place where you're thinking, well, what other things do I know about that can relate back to these signs or symptoms? And you start testing for those things. Is this story that I'm telling you, is it making sense with regards to the scientific method? Yes. Okay. So you make a hypothesis, you can see a bunch of signs and symptoms, you predict a possibility. Could it possibly be this? You know, is my baby pulling on their ears? That's sometimes a sign of an ear infection. Maybe he has an ear infection. Well, maybe we should look to see if he has an ear infection. What are other signs of an ear infection? And you go from there. And then you determine maybe it's not an ear infection. Maybe there's something else going on. Or maybe, you know, is, is the inside of the ear, is it looking like it's inflamed? Is it looking like it's swollen? That's a sign of an ear infection. If that isn't there, then you've got to dismiss that hypothesis and move to your next hypothesis and develop a new hypothesis and test that. So it's all, so when, you, when you're looking at the scientific method, it is all about look, trying to observe, make records of what you observe and develop a hypothesis and develop a proposal based on what you see. And I don't, I can't see myself for some reason right now, but if you see this kitty right here that just jumped in my lap, this is my kitty that I was talking about a second ago. Hi kitty, what's his name or her his, name? His name is Leo. Leo, hi Leo, he's so cute. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but he's doing really well right now, so we'll see what happens. If he, go, if he goes downhill during the semester, I'll tell you, and you'll know that my hypothesis didn't work for the inflammatory bowel syndrome. Uh, or, or it, yeah, that it was an inflammatory bowel disease. So understanding biochemistry is essential to understanding anatomy and physiology. Remember, anatomy is a study of the structures. Physiology is a functioning of those structures. And structure is, is intertwined with function. If the structure isn't correct, the function probably will not, it will not function right. So biochemistry is the study of the molecules or structures that make up living organisms. Matter is anything that occupies gap space and has mass. It can exist in three different states, a solid, such as a, um, your liver tissue, a liquid, such as the blood, or a gas such as oxygen or carbon dioxide or nitric oxide. The most important matter in the body are four different types of biomolecules that are, com that are compo each are composed of chemical elements. Carbohydrates, fats, proteins, and glucose. I that's the wrong one, New, you guys. This is a typo. This should be nucleic acids down here. And N is in um, N is in November. U is in uniform. C is in Charlie. L is in Lima. E is in Echo. I is in India. C is in Charlie. Nucleic. And then acid. A is in Alpha. C is in Charlie. I is in India. D is in Delta. S is in Sierra. So that's a typo right there. Put nucleic acid instead. And I'll correct that pretty quickly here, as soon as we're done with class. Hey, stay with me for two more minutes, and then we'll be done for today. Chemical elements are the unique substances that cannot be broken down into simpler substances by normal 
chemical methods. The most common chemical, chemical elements of the body are carbon oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, calcium, and phosphorus. A good mnemonic for remembering the major elements that make up the body here is SHNOPS, which is C is in Charlie, H is in Hotel, O is in Oscar, N is in November, P is in Papa. So C, C, sorry, I may have spelled that wrong. C is in Charlie, H is in Hotel, O is in Oscar, N as in November, and P is in Papa. And put that schnapps, the C stands for calcium and carbon. Other lesser elements are sulfur, potassium, chlorine, and magnesium. We also have some trace elements. Tend to be more minerals that you have to, that need to be taken in it through your diet. Surely all of these are minerals that need to be taken in through your diet. So several of the elements that make up the human body are minerals that you need to take in through your diet. They make up approximately 4% of the total body weight. You guys, let's stop on this slide, and I will see you on Wednesday morning. All right, sounds good. Have a good, have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Can I stay for two minutes? Hi, Doctor Chiesa. Doctor. Yes. Can I take you for two minutes after of class? Of course. Okay, thank you. Let, let's let's let every everybody else leave here. Okay, thank you. Um, bear with me, I'm going to stop the recording too. Um, I do have a question quick. What's your question? But, um, I tend to her first. She need a question. Okay. Somebody I, wanted to oh, ask you something. I so I want the person to go ahead first. Oh, I understand. Let me see if I can stop this recording. Bear with me just for a second here. Oh.